many. It's a rainy night here on uh, uh, September 27, 2010. We have uh, two guests here that are doing monumentally important work in terms of lifting the consciousness of the planet along the issues that are involved with uh, drugs and particularly marijuana. And they've been doing marvelous work. And Joe Barton, on my right here, has, uh, is, has been involved in that for a very, very long time and has done um, pace setting work in terms of challenging, I guess in a certain sense, he'll talk to you about it, at, a, at an elemental level, the whole war on drugs that was announced and how we've locked so many people up in prison. And I think we agreed in a sense that we made a big mistake in terms of uh, building prisons to house people for smoking a little marijuana cigarette or something. And in fact, the cannabis and, 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 and marijuana have great curative properties that go way back. We made society a big mistake, and it's pretty clear in the air now that that is being readdressed. That it's becoming legal in many states and so forth, and the whole tide is that we're re-examining that and making up for the mistakes we made about the war on drugs. They've both been involved in that, doing great programming, and so they're gonna to talk to us about it. And so please welcome Joe Barton, extraordinary, exponent of uh, cannabis sanity and his lovely friend Paula Gloria, our producer. <laughs> and so without further ado, let me introduce it. Joe, why don't you just introduce yourself and then you two can talk and we'll talk around the issues that I sort of uh, introduced there. Welcome, Joe. Thank okay. you. Um, Try to speak up if you can for the camera. Oh, okay, I'm Joe Barton. And, uh, I've, I've been a marijuana activist for 40 years. Most of what I've been fighting for is to free the prisoners, the nonviolent marijuana prisoners. But I've been trying to work to get people out and have to stop putting people in. I've been fighting the court because I was arrested for growing marijuana. And I've been fighting the court case trying to change the law. That's pretty much what I've been up to for the past 40 years. And <coughs> Speak up, Paula, I've got a daily public access television show called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole. It was about spirituality and politics. Um, prior to that show, I had a holistic dentistry show called The Whole Tooth. Uh, we talked about the tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth. <laughs> and, from, and from that, I branched off into many other things. Because when your body is balanced and strong, then it's capable of supporting activities in, in practically any. So I started to look at the mercury in the body, wondering why some people can handle a lot of mercury. Other people, if you took mercury out of the mouth, their health would improve, if they had cancer, maybe they would recover. But at the same time, I noticed there'd be dentists that were in their 90s who had been handling mercury all of their professional career, which would be you know, 60 or 70 years. And, and they were fine. So that got me interested in energy systems. And then I went to India for four years in between the two shows <clears throat> because I was convinced by a master in the South to study the Divine Mother. I had no idea what that meant. And began to slowly realize it was more about the five elements and nature. Does God come from nature? Does nature come from God? So as my show, farther down the rabbit hole, advanced from, the reason I called it that was because what the belief do we know was popular when I came back from India. And I had had interviews with people on that movie, and I felt our interviews were deeper because it, 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 it revolves around a group in the Northwest. They follow a channeled entity called Ram. So we were doing the interviews mostly for people in that particular cult. And I say cults, you know, not in a demeaning way. You just have people who sort of branch off in different groups, focusing on different things. So I called my show Farther Down the Rabbit Hole because I thought we wanted to talk this more deeply. It was a weekly call-in show. I'd start off a half an hour with provocative material, and then the other half hour I would take calls. Uh, after a few months, some of the calls were kind of they weren't my typical callers. My typical callers were sort of new age. And these were people who were, um, 
I guess you'd call them punk callers or crank callers. And so I started telling my viewers they were cranky callers because they had some unmet needs. And I was using Marshall Rosenberg's principles of nonviolent communication because throughout all my travels in India, I found that his principles were some of the most useful. When I was in Kashmir, I was in a refugee camp that had all the Brahmins that had been uh, sort of um, had to leave Kashmir when they sort of had, you know, all the Muslims taken over. And they were kind of uptight and bitter about it. But I found when I used Marshall Rosenberg's principles, I could get a real dialogue going. And it was really exciting. So I was really enthused when I came back to India to convince Alan Steinfeld, who I was working with, to take his show, New Realities, and make it New Realities Global Public Access. That's what my real desire was. Well, it, it turned out there was an opportunity to go daily, and Alan felt it was too much work, and I wanted to do it, against enormous odds, because I depended on Alan to do everything, to do camera work, to do editing, and I had to learn all that myself. <coughs> plus get myself up there, and I had been rich when I left, and I was poor when I returned, so I learned how to ride a bicycle, I got up there and back, I started to learn how to edit. My first shows are kind of a travesty, of lack of editing, but I just kept powering on, and the callers would be so interesting, and even the crank callers, what I call cranky callers, were also interesting because in order to set up a good spoof, they had to pay attention probably a lot more than they wanted to pay attention to some of these topics. And eventually, those calls found their way onto Howard Stern, who thought it was really hilarious that I was dealing with these topics, and, uh, and then dealing with the callers in that way. So pretty soon I got into 9-11 Truth, and I got into that because I was trying to find out where my lost fortune went. And that sort of took me on a distracting path, and then I found out that distraction itself was part of the problem. And then I decided I wanted to go for something where you could really ascertain what the truth was. And it seemed to me that was the human body. And so I thought, if something is really true and working, then people are going to get better with that knowledge. And if it's not true, then they're not going to get better. So I became interested in cancer cures. And then I hooked up with Dr. Jane Goldberg, when I went to the Upper West Side to follow up on what Alan said, is that this man was treating cancer with radioactive stones. And I thought, that just sounds so weird. But, you know, I had a free ride up there. Molly had her car. She was in town. So we thought it'd be kind of a fun thing to, to go up there. And I actually had the first moments that I met Jane on camera because I was recording the speaker talking about the radioactive stones curing cancer. And then he threw me one of these pads made out of the, the filings that he could kind of adjust <clears throat> when they're cutting the stone. And I put it on. You know, I just laid it on, not expecting anything to happen. I had my camera on. I thought, Ooh. You know, and I had a very nice feeling. And I realized there's, there's a lot to this. And then Jane got very interested in the research. And then she paid for me to go with her down to a clinic in Colorado. It was actually, somebody gave them an old brothel because it was in a really remote part of Colorado. And people that had cancer were coming to be cured of cancer. And it was an opportunity to, uh, to get to know the work better. So I collected the footage. And Jane was doing more of the research. And she wasn't sharing with me so much at the beginning. But towards the end, when I had to start pulling it together and do the editing, I had to pay attention more to where the direction was going. I think the reason she wasn't sharing with me so much is because her paradigm was shifting so radically. Because being sort of a left liberal Jewish New Yorker, and, and very similar to being from Berkeley, where you actually have signs posted, nuclear free zone, to start to find out that we actually need radiation like a vitamin, was a big shift. So I started to do the, I was also learning Final Cut Pro while all this was happening. And there was some, there was one moment in particular where I was just freaked out. I said, the expo is coming up. I'm not going to have the DV done on time. What am I going to do? And there were paradox, you know, paradoxes with what the scientists were saying, different scientists. 
So I sort of closed my eyes and I said, please, you know, it was like, it was one of those spontaneous prayers, and I go, please help me figure out what's being said. And I sort of got into this more peaceful state, and then without any effort, was able to do another six hours of editing. So in total, I must have been on those computers 13 hours, which was really nice for the staff at m and because they don't usually let you go on the computers more than six hours, so other people get their turn. But it was a breakthrough experience for me because I had used more of the stones because the research was so compelling that when I started to go through some detox symptoms, I just decided to power forward rather than pull back on the stones. So as I powered forward, I began to realize when I was at home, where are my reading glasses? And I go, you know, I haven't even been looking for my reading glasses. Oh my God, I can read without my reading glasses. And then I began to see that I had never heard of this before. Jay, the man who was working with cancer patients, had never talked about this as a possibility. And then he gave a hint in one of the lectures of where he got a lot of information about this. So I went to that website and I contacted them. I said, would, would one of you or some of you or all of you on this radioactivity blog like to come on my show? And I was given a resounding no. We do not want to be on your show. We do not want anybody except us to even know that we're doing this because uh, they felt that there would be too much heat from the nuclear industry, which actually is pretty much ass backwards because they talk about they talk about things in such an opposite way that the very industry that you would expect would be promoting one thing is promoting another thing. And it just winds up with people being confused. But they felt that they had the real research, they were getting the real results, and they felt that they would be attacked and they didn't want the sharing that they were doing among themselves to be stopped. I remember also doing one show where a lady called in from Pennsylvania. I was sort of turned on to her work by some of the people working with Jay Gutierrez. And I found out from her that she had a a Mennonite or a um, Amish lady who had breast cancer very badly. It was weeping and boozing from February and in July. She ordered a particularly radioactive stone from Jay, placed it on her breast, and practically overnight it had shifted. Mm. So then I began to look for what would be the models that would explain this. And the best, actually it was Barbara here that actually turned me on to that, which was a Dr. Tullio Simoncini, who wrote a book, Cancer as a Fungus. So I looked at that, I was very intrigued, I thought, well, could his explanation be what accounts for this uh, recovery in, this, in the case of this lady's breast? Later on, I found out again that the kind of work I was doing was going against the wishes of the researchers and the healers. They just wanted peace and quiet so they could connect with the people who were suffering and be left in peace. So there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm about what I was doing with the documentary, which was problematic because I'd expected the documentary to be distributed that way. And it wasn't. So I sort of, you know, kind of licked my wounds and decided to just carry on with my show. And then I discovered Rick Simpson. I'm not sure how I discovered him. But he was healing cancer with high concentrations of cannabis oil. And I did a show with him. You can see the very first show I did, I'm kind of fumbling on his name. I'm not even quite knowing his name. Because when I see something really good, I call him up and I decide to roll the camera right away. And, you know, kind of catch the fresh energy. So uh, Rick and I had a good connection. It was really nice and exciting. But the problem was, is cannabis is illegal, and I didn't have access to any source to get it. And this was a problem for a long time, for over a year. I would run around and beg people. I, I told Alan, I said, you know, do you know somebody that you know deals pot and could get me some pot? I'll, I'll, I'll go and make it myself. I was actually, through Joe Friendly, I was up with one dealer, and there was the pot, it was a pound of pot, there was a guy with prostate cancer, and here was me, totally willing, he closed the deal, I could get the pot that 
that I would take it home and I would roll the cameras and I would make it with all the windows open in my apartment and the fans blowing so I wouldn't blow myself up. And then after I had the footage, I would figure out later on how to get it out on the internet in a way that I would be safe. Because I always felt if you're, if you're moving forward and your intention is to help people and to heal people, then surely your intentions will be protected. Well, everybody just freaked out. They just, oh, all of this is so dangerous, you're going to be thrown in jail and don't do it. And, and then, you know, and then the guy with the pot wanted seven and a half thousand dollars and the guy with the prostate cancer decided that was too much money. So that deal never, never went down. And so I went home, you know, and I was, you know, sort of close, but it, it didn't happen. And I had always maintained an interest in it. And then I saw this little card that Frank Craven gave me. And it was so well worded. I realized so many of the cannabis activist groups were just a turn off. They didn't excite me. They didn't interest me. It, it just it, it didn't seem to address where my uh, research was going. But this one had everything. This one talked about the cancer cure. That was always something that never talked about in any of the cannabis groups. And it also talked about freeing prisoners, because I realized if I wanted to make the oil, or even Rick Simpson himself, who had cured thousands of people and had a horrendous court case going on. So I realized that these two issues were very connected, and they would never be mentioned in any of the cannabis groups, activist groups I saw up to that point. I remember Carol used to use this expression, uh, in, in regard to people being really enthusiastic about their activism and saying, we don't know where we're going, but we're on our way. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't know where you're going and you're on your way, you might actually go the opposite direction of where you really want to be going. So you should know where you're going. But when you start to meet healers who are actually having really compelling results, then you know you're on to something. So this was April 30th. It, it was up in Albany. I didn't have a car. I didn't know how to do the bus. I didn't know where to go. Bus got there, and so I go, Frank, please, please, please take me up there. And so Frank convinced his girlfriend, because I think by this time his car was broken, and, and she was a cannabis activist, and they pulled it off. And I went in the back, I was in the back seat, and went up there, and that's when I saw Camp Citizens Against Marijuana Prohibition. And when Abigail Storms first spoke, I had an experience similar. <coughs> to what Molly describes when she first met me. And it was like, Abigail said something that sort of made my soul come alive. Because she, she, she spoke so quickly, she didn't find any of the things that I was saying annoying. A lot of times in my enthusiasm, when I'm behind the camera, I can have an onslaught of so many comments or questions that, that people get you know, turned off, intimidated, and you know, they want to run away. But Abigail, you know, she just, as fast as I could dish out my questions, she kept feeling it and coming back with more. And I think, I can't remember, it was, do you know that bus stop was really in the then? She, she started the little track. No, I wasn't there. I was, you came later on, because you were at I was set up equipment. You were set up, okay. So, I think it was Nathan Cohen and his wife with the um, the uh, Woodstock Wood Museum. So we trailed over, and then <coughs> the sound equipment was set up, and then Joe got on, and he gave a very short, but very powerful and compelling um, few statements. And the last thing he ended with was uh, that we had to focus on getting the prisoners out, and he goes, otherwise you might be next. Now, I had never thought that way. I was not, and still am not, a smoker of cannabis. So I never felt any pressure about being arrested or anybody stopping me and searching me because I figured, you know, I'm a public access producer. I love it when people watch me, you know. But I realized that a lot of these people, you know, that were collecting and gathering, it, any one of them could be arrested. Any one of them could be thrown into jail. And in the case of wherever they got, if they had a little bit, a few joints or whatever, they had to procure that from somewhere. So wherever they procured it from, over 25 grams, that's a big bust. And I had taught meditation in San Quentin prison, so I've been in, on the inside of a 
high security prison. And it just said, that, that makes a lot of sense. You should get active or you might be next. It was, it, it was very impressive. Mm -hmm. And so then a month later, there were more groups and then uh, more those kind of gatherings. And then I invited people to come down. There was an AIDS walk in Central Park and someone at St. Mark's Church, I said, you know, this AIDS stuff is, is, is a big distraction. If, any, if anybody has these symptoms, they're certainly not going to be cured with what these groups are promoting. And he said, you know, Paula, don't be so such a purist. Just come and hand out your own literature. I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll just come and hand out my own literature. So I called up camp, Citizens Against Marijuana Prohibition. I said, why don't you come down and I'll videotape you. And so they came down. And, uh, and they came with Joe, and I got some really amazing footage with Joe, talking about an experience that he had with a lot of hashish. I guess it was in oil, and we were out for a couple of days. Yeah, it was Afghani hash patterns. Some of the best hash that ever came in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and so, and I realized our scientists really, because it's on schedule one, they can't get research done on it, they can't get grants for it. And as a result, they know nothing about it. And I found somebody who knew a lot about it. So, <laughs> so that's how I met Joe and I started to do more work. And I tell you, every day I'm learning more and I'm trying to get it all up on my, uh, my channel. Of, um, farther down the rabbit hole, we go live, we get call-ins. I'm absolutely thrilled that going from New Age to Howard Stern prank calls and now getting more calls from uh, from Harlem and, and the people in jail, there are more blacks in jail, more Hispanics in jail, way, way more than whites. Even though I heard statistically whites are smoking more, it's the blacks that are going to jail more. So I'm really honored to have more of them as my audience now. I heard that Eminem is playing more of my shows in the off time. So I had one astrologer on, and he was really pushing doing astrology. And he said, I've got a Jamaican following now, you know, which was really wonderful to know because, you know, they're very savvy about this plant, and I know I can learn a lot from him. So that's, um, that's my spiel. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs>
Well, I'll tell you what, I was in the most beautiful place you could ever be. When that cold water hit me and brought me back to this reality, I was pissed off. <laughs> I told him, get the fuck out of my house, don't come back. Really? I said they weren't even going to die. Yeah, yeah, they told me they were, and I said, and I told him, if I'm going to die, if that's where I'm going, let me die. Because it was such a beautiful place. And I crawled out of the tub and went back and laid down. And they came back the next day and we Another were day. <laughs> we, and we were still passed out, me and Charlie. And then they came back on the fourth day and they managed to wake us up. And mostly I remember waking up because I was so thirsty. Otherwise I was I, I was content to stay there. It was such a beautiful place. Um, I forgot what, where I was going. Sixty eight. That was sixty eight. Yeah, nineteen sixty eight. Yeah. And um, well, is that the scientists don't know anything about it, and now we have cancer patients, people. I mean, I, people write in, and they tell me about their results, and they share pictures and things. And it seems as though the biggest problem is there's this mindset, which I have to admit I also had. Being a meditator, I always thought that drugs are bad, and you're not supposed to be doing them if you're a really pure meditator, that you've got to go the, the pure path and be self-sufficient all that. And I began to realize that, that these are very, very valuable tools if they're used uh, with wisdom. And patients, people who have access to good oil, because there's also a problem about good oil and bad oil. If they have good oil, they're not taking the quantities that Rick says you need to take in order to get the cure. So, yeah, yeah. The oil she's talking about is extracted from marijuana. If you extract the oil from marijuana, in the 60s, we used to call it hash oil. Now they call it THC, and a lot of people call it Rick Simpson. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I recommend everyone see Run From the Cure, the full version of Rick Simpson. Rick Simpson cured 2,000 people with hash oil. And he was arrested. What do they call it hemp oil? Two? He calls it hemp oil. Yeah, he called it hemp oil. In the 60s, we called it hash oil, which is basically the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. But not to be confused with hemp seed oil. It doesn't have any THC. It has a lot of other really it's good THC things. that has the properties. Is that right, correct? Right. Okay. Because some because some uh, people have been trying to market this, this stuff that does not have any THC. Yes, CBDs. Yeah, I don't know why they were not marketing it. Well, well so they're marketing it in, in the United States for food. And to get what I want, because I I kept my eyes on this on that this, uh, the marketing hemp foods out like right? hemp seed oil, right, right. and it's good, it's yeah. good food, um, and um, the marketing whatever they can, whatever forms of the hemp plant they can that don't have the uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, right? You said that hemp seed oil has no THC, right? Right. Um, well, that's why they're they're able to do that, I guess. And um, I, I wanted to ask you, if you're going to use. Um, hemp oil um, in any way for, for in healing or, or to, to get high, right. how, how do you take it? Do you smoke it or, or do you, you burn can, it? You can smoke it, but smoking is not the best method because you waste a lot, you burn it, you destroy a lot when you burn it. Mm -hmm. The best way to do it is eat it. Eat it? Eat it. You mean like raw or bake it in something? Or? Well, you can bake it in something or you can just eat it just raw. Isn't it like a tiny bit you have to take yeah. it? Yeah. Um, a drop the size of a grain of rice will get you nice. It'll get you high. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Poet. But the cancer the size patients of a grain have, of rice will get the you The cancer high. patients have to work their way up to at least a gram a day. And recently I heard Rick talk about a terminal patient who didn't have much time at all. And he took 50 grams a month. So that's almost two grams a day. So that kind of person has to kind of get over it there stigma against hippies and, and the whole system. Yes, I'm mm -hmm. kind of afraid of going for radiation every day and every minute. Try and speak up, Barbara, please. I have a can. friend who's, who's, uh, who's going for radiation uh, and has to go every day for the next three or four weeks. And she's not the kind of person who can tell you, you know, that you, you don't have to do this. Get her to watch the Rick Simpson video. Well, right now she's in the hospital. Yeah. 
this is a corporate culture, you know, and, and um, they've got somehow, I think they have people conditioned a lot to, to all this morality, and we're still under the influence of the movie Reefer Madness. Right. Oh, right. I mean, a oh, lot of us movie. are. Yeah. Right. It is breaking up, as I think you were saying before, uh, or Harold was saying before, with Definitely. The, uh, um, the, the, some of the states now. Right. Um, working separate from the federal government to uh, legalize medical marijuana. Um, but none of them, one of the problems with the, with, the, with the way they're doing it, none of the states are allowing the hemp oil. They'll, they'll allow you to smoke marijuana, but smoking marijuana doesn't cure anything. It relieves symptoms, but it doesn't cure anything. I, I, I protest you that. I, I had an experience from my own smoking marijuana. And I'd rather not smoke because I'd rather not get the smoke in my lungs. Right. I'd rather take something by mouth. And uh, I'd love to have some, some hemp oil. And, and I just wonder, it, it's, it's a high, light smoking marijuana, more or less? Yeah, but it, 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 it can be much more intense than just smoking a joint. Can you smoke a joint anyway? Yeah, you can smoke. Yeah. I mean, when you're using it? Yeah, I eat oil and smoke joints all the time. Would you call it psychedelic? Um, well, there's two kinds. There's also two kinds of hemp oil um, because there's basically two kinds of marijuana. One is uh, cannabis indica, which is a very uh, down kind of body, like a, not a barbiturate, but it's, it has that kind of where it puts you to sleep or lays you down, grogs you out. And then there's cannabis sativa, which is a, a very up high. It's much more, that's more of a psychedelic kind of high. You're, you're more awake and active. Well, it depends how much you do. You know, of any of it, if you do if you do a large dose, it's going to lay you down. You know? But uh, the visions you'll have are worth the lay down. Um. Could you, could you make a distinction and make it clear, because I think it's probably new to even a lot of people who might be viewing, the curative properties of hemp oil as a, as a curative, as opposed to, let's say, a recreational thing like alcohol or something. But that's a distinction I think well, is worth oil, underscoring. It's, it's, uh, THC and CBDs, mm. which the scientists, all, all the latest research, and quite a bit has been done, have said that uh, that's what, that is what's in the marijuana that cures people, the combination of the THC and the CBDs. Mm -hmm. Can I ask what CBD stands for? Yeah, I don't know that uh, one either. It's, not, it's another cannabinoid, but I don't know exactly the exact... Cannabinol? You mean it's a cannabinol? There's cannabidiol. There's supposed to be about 60 things. No, we don't. We don't. Well, we could have, but we don't have a machine that works, right? right. Well, he's. Oh, wait. There's a call. Oh, go ahead. Talk. I brought. I brought videos. To give yeah, he's going to give them all. Give everybody a copy so they can, you can just watch it at home and start us all sitting here and watching it. Now, Dr. Wild, Andrew Wild, publicly came out and said, you know, physicians used to be able to write prescriptions for cannabis and and it was no big thing. And all of a sudden, I think it was 1937, right. that they, uh, for some reason, they... The reason is they couldn't get a hold of the thing because if they never really outlawed it, they taxed it so high that the farmers couldn't pay the tax. So it was sort of an insidious way to get around it. Uh, to get around it. Well, what made it illegal? And something else that a lot of people don't know. Are not constitutional. That's how the joke I have. Well, how could, it, how, could, how could a government make an herb illegal? It's not, it's not, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's, what we, that's what we've been asking for 70 years. How could an herb be illegal? It's not, you know, you can use it for anything. It doesn't necessarily. You have to figure prohibition of alcohol. It just ended. And they had a whole force to keep it employed. So it's sort of shifted over that. It's really all about monopoly. And yeah. it's all about the Constitution. And Joe pointed out to me the other day that we almost had written into our Constitution a right to medicine. 
Yes, uh, George Washington's doctor, when they were deciding the Constitution, um, he had one. He had one of his complaints was that they didn't put in the in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that we had a right to, that we as individuals had a right to medicine to pick our own, grow our own, choose our own. And one of the things that he said at, at that time was if we if they allowed the doctors to control it, after a while we would lose all medical rights. And it's turned out that he was right. Joe, you, you, you show Dr. Wilde Speak up, film, please. or uh, Clark on that film in the Yippie Museum. Dr. Wilde appeared in that film as a proponent of hemp yeah. and hemp cures and so on. And I remember talking to him at Columbia Presbyterian. He used to come to give instruction all the time. And I wondered why he disappeared. And he disappeared because he started becoming a proponent of the madness of hemp. Yeah. He had sort of disappeared from the sea. He was on He's uh, back. Channel 13. He's back. And today in the senior center, we were discussing, I, I invited them to come here and listen to you and Paula. And they agreed with me that hemp should be uh, revitalized and brought back into our society and culture, and uh, they're very well, much aware. All these old timers who had 10 years on me in Shanti's generation and my generation agreed that this is a draconian society that's backward. As you know, on Sunday night, the FBI raided and searched the homes of eight peace activists Minneapolis. in uh, Chicago. Yes, and Minneapolis on mm. television today, and this is a very this is not this is not a democracy at all. And if you the more you know about the society in this country, it's not a democracy at all. I mean, today someone asked the question, why don't we have more socialism? And one of the reasons is that the powers that be in this society have stopped socialism completely. I hear every. Uh, when Montserrat was removed, most people don't realize that he was the first senator, state senator removed. In 1920s, they removed five socialist sen senators from the New York State Senate. Also, Eugene V. Debs got a million votes when he ran for president of the United States, and he was in prison, in federal prison, when he received a million votes in the 20s when he ran for, so this, at every twist and turn, this country and this society has been pushed backwards. Okay. Has, so, Josh, I have to contest that a bit. I think there definitely are some ways where this is a de democratic society, and there are some ways where it's clearly not. Yeah, it's there, democratic it's if you have money, big money, and that's about well, it. Well, even, even Thank you. Some, <laughs> in some areas, some areas. But there definitely is what you're saying. There's a lot of uh, stupidly uh, undemocratic authoritarianism that's profit motivated largely. And how motivated? I, I'm not disagreeing entirely. There's a, there's a lot of that. But this this issue of the medical properties is is the do you have any, does Rick know Rick Simpson or you or anybody who's following it? Do they have any inkling of the scientific community as a community and people who are interested in curatives and things like that? That they're aware of the <clears throat> they're aware of the curative properties that uh, hemp has, and are they just covering it up for some economic reason, or if they are, how do they handle it themselves personally in keeping it not available to us in terms of the? consciousness of the society and is it beginning to emerge even though there is some stop to the curative properties that cannabis pr proposed by people that have prejudices or how do we deal with that? Well, let me tell What's you, the reality? The government in 1974, the DEA funded research at the Virginia Medical College and the American Cancer Society funded research at the Virginia Medical College and they wanted to prove that marijuana caused cancer. But when they did the research in 1974, the research came up that marijuana, that the, 
the THC oil from marijuana cured cancer. Definitively? Now, our de government knew this in 1974. Definitively. Definitively. Yeah. And they took the research and buried it and hid it and kept it from being known publicly. A few, are, a few newspaper articles got out. And, and I one, one peer review journal. Right. And I heard it mentioned um, one time on television, and I never heard it mentioned again. Right? And, um, you mean back in the day? Back in 1974, yeah. You know, Do you I, I was already in, involved with oil then, yeah. more for recreation. I didn't know about the healing problem. But when I heard it, it stuck in my mind. And then I didn't think, you know, think about it. I hadn't heard anything more about it up until Rex Simpson. Yeah. come out with the with his video run from the cure mm -hmm. right um, which I would recommend everyone look up on the internet and type in run from the cure Rick Simpson full version what one follow-up do you think the the obvious fact that everybody can sense what's going on in the society is that the constriction against marijuana and cannabis is lessening and that the society is making a big turn in that direction. Is it the information that's getting out about the curative properties of serious illnesses that the cannabis oil has, is that what's leading it? No. Or how, how do you compare it to the approbation no, the, that no, the society has against getting high, as they say, or getting your consciousness now, altered? Now, they're, they're scamming everybody. They're saying, we're allowing medical marijuana, but they're only allowing people to smoke. You can't, you can't extract the oil. You can't have ash. You can't have the things that actually cure. And there's no provision. Why? For That's what I'm trying to get at. Why? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, this is the pharmaceutical company. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm getting at, yeah. I used to work during the 60s and 70s with lots of young people, and they were all smoking, taking it whatever. And uh, what I discovered was that there are two reasons why the government is against it. And that is, number one, Taking psychedelics or smoking marijuana has a transcendental effect. Yes. Because you transcend the normal bullshit of the average society you and you are somehow somewhere where they don't want you to be because then you will be Spiral. bad, <laughs> bad, uh, out of control, out bad, of bad what? Bad what, Joe? Bad uh, citizens. Consumers. Consumers, Consumers, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Influence. yeah. And then there is a second thing. Both marijuana in a smaller way, but uh, the psychedelics uh, in a much larger extent, are psyched and are revolutionary drugs. Yes. Because once you are aware, you know, it's like you have this telescope, the spiritual telescope, right. and you see reality differently than the average person. Right. You will be so shaken by the horrendousness of what is happening. The Thank you. The horrendousness of reality. Yeah. That right. you want to change it. Right. right. You know? Like I have pers personally, and it's a little bit uh, almost uh, very peculiar coincidence, my 37-year-old daughter that for several years, uh, several years ago, and today she had the second mastectomy and is right now in the recovery room. So there is a kind of a strange, uh, uh, you know, coincidence that we are talking about it uh, uh, because uh, these things, you know, you are talking about how it could have been prevented if that doctor thought. The, the federal government knew in 1974 that the oil cures breast cancer. Yeah, I heard you. Right, right, right. That's one of the main ones that it cures. Yeah, yeah, well, certain people in the government. Uh, you see, all, you know, health. Right, right. right. The Surgeon health? General maybe wasn't informed. You don't health? know who ran the studies. You don't know who was in Rick Simpson right now is a fugitive hiding out in Europe. A man who cured 2,000 people. Documented. Documented. 
Well, well, just like a quasi document. Okay. You know, because you have to be careful. You can't be keeping names and numbers and details of people because you put them in harm's way. But and and then a lot of them, after they were given this medicine free, he took one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of his own settlement money. This is, if you look at the documentary, you'll see that the journey that he took was he had a very bad problem, a head injury, and no pharmaceutical that was given to him would address it. And finally, uh, after he's sort of had a lot of bad side effects, somebody gives him a joint and he realized he felt better than he'd ever felt with any of the medication. So when he tried to get a prescription, because it's technically, you're supposed to be able to uh, get it legally in Canada, but you have a better chance to win the lottery than to get one of these. It makes it seem, oh, you know, now you can get it. Everybody thinks you can get it. But the truth, when we try to get it, it's very difficult and his doctor would not give it to him. And he said, well, why? And he goes, well, they need to study it more. It was like 5,000 years to study a plant. How much time do you need? And he said, well, if, I, if it's bad for your lungs. And then Rick said, well, what if I make an oil out of it and take it that way? And the doctor thought well, that would be a good thing to do. So Rick did it that way. He was so enthusiastic about his results that just like Joe said, he remembered in the radio briefly announcing these studies in 74, saying that THC cured cancer, so that when he came back from his dermatologist after being operated on for his skin cancer, going, you know, he sort of remembers this, this radio show that THC cured cancer, and he said, well, it helped my head injury, so he put it on his skin, and five days later, the skin cancer dropped off, he went to his dermatologist, the dermatologist freaked out, and then he went to the Canadian Cancer Society, to the UN, he starts to go to all of these institutions, really believing that they were looking for the cure for cancer. While this happened, he got $125,000 settlement money for his head injury, which still continues, and that's why he's a fugitive, because even if you had a license in Canada for cannabis, if you make any violation, you have one too many plants or whatever, and they put you in jail or prison, they won't give you your medicine. And Rick feels without it, he won't survive. And so that's why he's a fugitive. Now with these hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, he really he went into full production. That's why he was able to cure so many people. He told the authorities, he goes, I'm I'm planting all of this in my fields. He had 1,600 plants when he was when he was busted, but all along he'd been telling people and he'd been curing people. But when it actually came to his court case, Christian Lorette told me he was very brokenhearted that a lot of people that he cured they wouldn't even sign an affidavit. So when we say documented, I want it to be really clear: it's really not documented in in that way because you're protecting these people. But there were lots and lots of them that wouldn't come forward, but there were enough of them that did come forward that when they went to the court, the, the judge wouldn't hear them and wouldn't hear the judge, wouldn't hear the doctors, meaning that the legal system and the judicial system was more afraid of these people and these results because it would implicate the judge. See, Rick would say, if you're not careful, you're going to be the one going to jail. Which is absolutely true, because these people take an oath to uphold their respective constitutions. The Canadian Constitution is not ours, but you know, it's pretty similar that, that these people who are working for, the government officers are working for the people, should exert themselves to protect the health of the people, and that's not what was happening. So they say the judge gave them a fairly good where was this judge? Where was this, this judge? This was in Canada, in Nova in Canada. Scotia. And the judge then stopped being a judge afterwards. So the prosecutor wanted, wanted Rick in jail for um, 12 years. So the prosecutor didn't give me one. And then Joe's case has definitely uh, advanced even more than what, what Rick did. What is your premise in your particular case, and how are you fighting? Um, well, I was fighting my case. A lot of people don't understand our Constitution and, and even our legal system. If you, when you get charged with a crime, like I, I was growing marijuana and I was giving uh, oil to, to cancer patients and some other patients. Um, and 
uh, when the police kicked in my door, they took all the plants that I was growing and the marijuana that I had and the ash oil that I had made. And now they charged me. But I learned um, the laws are all based on, on lies, right? And nobody really challenges them as they're based on lies. Um, Abigail Storm, who she had been talking about earlier, went up to the legislature and she was doing research. And she found in their own documents when Originally, we had the Rockefeller laws, which were very strict. And when they wanted to de so supposedly decriminalize marijuana, which they actually only decriminalized 25 grams. If you had more than that, it's back up to being jail time, right? Um, but when they were gonna, wanted to decriminalize it, they, in their own paperwork, they put um, uh, scientific. scientific evidence clearly shows no significant harm or no harm at all from marijuana use. Now, if the legislature said that, and then they turned around and made criminal penalties for marijuana. In my case, I'm saying I'm a sovereign human being. According to the Constitution, we the people have freedom to do what, whatever we want to do as long as we're not violating someone else's rights, right? Um, so I'm saying that if the legislature says that it does no harm, how can they have criminal penalties for it? So, um, the, judge, the, the judge in our case, we kept putting in more, uh, I was my own, my own attorney. If you want, there's two ways to fight the court case. If you get a lawyer, you go into a court case as a defendant. That's like playing on a chessboard where all the rules are stacked against you. There's no way to win the game. But if you go into court without a lawyer and stand on your sovereignty, now you're on a different chessboard and they don't know how to deal with you. All of them, we kept putting in paperwork, paperwork, and they wouldn't even answer it. They refused to answer Well, they do know how to deal with it if they're dealing with just laws. But when you have an unconstitutional law to start with, that's when they don't know how to deal with it. Right, well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Why isn't anybody brought into court to uh, contest the constitutionality of that is what I'm doing. Um, I would think a lot of people might be doing that. Yeah. Do they just uh, fluff it off in case? What's that? How long has this case been going on and what, where? Now we're coming up on two years. And um, they would, normally they, normally if I had gone in as a defendant with a, with a lawyer, within three months they'd have had me in jail. But doing this. And a lot of jail. So, what, so let me let me get this right. Did they give they they confiscated your plants. Did they give you a summons? Did they they give you an order? Did they have? Well, they arrested me. Arrest warrant. They yeah, they arrested me. They, did they did they have a, a warrant to search your home? Um, yes, but it was an illegal warrant. I we proved that in court too. You know, um, now they should when we first of all. In order to get a warrant, they have to do it legally. They trespassed on our property on two occasions and looked in our windows and sniffed at my door, okay. said that they smelled marijuana. That was their, one of the reasons that they got a warrant. But according to the law, they have to have facts to get a warrant, not come on the property and search the property and then go get a warrant because it's called the fruit of a poison tree. What the evidence that they gained, they gained illegally. Now we proved that in court, and the judge, the prosecutor should have moved to dismiss it. He didn't. The judge should have dismissed it. He didn't. So um, we were, uh, after doing it for 18 months, fighting. And never having a motion to answer. And right. going through several judges, one of whom said the constitutional issues should be resolved. Right. So it's, it's like you're in a black hole. What, what never get charged with? Um, possession of, of over 10 pounds of marijuana. They say I have 47 pounds um, and hash oil and hash. But um, we had, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. You, you took the after 18 months. Oh, after 18 months of them not answering anything and um, we cited 
Supreme Court cases that, that were it was in our favor, they wouldn't even rule on it or say anything. They just ignored most of our motions, right? And also the judge, we asked the judge to recuse himself because the, 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 the narcotics team, which was called Urgent, Ulster County Regional Gang the Narcotics Enforcement Team, right, um, that kicked in our door. The judge on my case raised money to form Urgent. So we asked the judge, how can he be impartial if you helped form the police? If I come question the police on the stand, how can you be impartial when you raised the money to form that organization? He refused to recuse himself. It's a branch of the police. And what state was that? Was it? New York. It was, all right, so it was in New York State. This, this is not a federal offense. Um, no, no, we weren't. We weren't arrested by the So the New York State, did they cite any New York State law that you were in violation of? Oh, yeah, all, all kinds of um, statute laws. But statutes, um, the law, our, our law in the United States is all based on the Constitution. Statutes are not, are not real law. Very few people understand that, and lawyers will never tell you that. You know, if you go in and say, um, I'm standing on my constitutional rights, just because you made a statute, don't make it law. It has to be checked, it has to be tested against the Constitution. A statute, does that mean it wasn't, was not voted on by any act of Congress or? No, it, the legislature can be, they get together and they make statutes all the time. But it doesn't mean that what they're doing has real authority under the Constitution. The Constitution delegates authority to this branch of government or this branch of government or the Supreme it's Court. The right? It's all set up to be balanced, right? But what's happened over over a lot of years, and now it's just become accepted by society, that they have, a, oh, they made a law, therefore it's the law and everybody should bow down to it. But the, they don't have, a lot of the laws that they're making, they don't have, the, under the Constitution, they really don't have the authority delegated to them to make that law. Right, and unless they are tested against the Constitution, is that what you were saying? Yeah, somebody's going to challenge right. it, and the judicial branch is part of that test. They're not no, not, not just challenge it, not just challenge it. They're supposed to, when they, when they swear an oath, all the politicians, judges, all of them swear an oath to uphold the Constitution, which means when they're making laws, they're supposed, to, they're supposed to check to make sure that what they're doing is constitutional. But they're not. They're taking money from big corporations to, to, to back what the corporations want. They're, they're not going by the Constitution and they're not doing what they swore an oath to do is protect the, we the people. And we the people have to, have to figure this out because it's not going to be handed to us. If you figure it out, then you can start to request it, and then you start to put the motion, you know, the machine starts to work in your favor. We'd be it's uh, a taking a lot of things to court to test the constitutionality. The courts would be overwhelmed. But that's but no, it should be. Because it should we be. Pay. We have it to pay too be. much for lawyers if we have lawyers. No, actually the drug wars is, is what has overburdened the judicial system and made it not work. Right. That's, that's really what's happened. The plea bargaining is something that's hardly constitutional, but it's, it's absolutely necessary to get anything done because the drug wars are so unconstitutional. And they've backed up the courts so much. They've backed up the courts so much with the drug with the drug laws that they got to run it through. They to, otherwise, they'd never get the courts done. So what they got to do is they got to push everybody and say, "Okay, we're going to give you ten years, but if you plead guilty, we'll only give you three." And, and these drug laws have not been tested to the Constitution? Um, are, are they constitutional? Do you well, know? We'll take the even, the even the Supreme Court right now is in the hands of the politicians. And in the, 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 they've ruled so much in, in, against the, the rights of the people. The Supreme Court is not doing what it was set up to do, and that was to protect our rights. And we should bring that up, but I've got a note here. I want to let you know the stream is working. So there are people maybe around the world who are listening to what you're saying, but we've come to the end of the tape. 
So I'm going to change the tape. So why don't we just take uh, just a minute while I change. Don't say anything really important because we can go right into the second tape, okay? All right. All right. Hello, Hello. Hello. Hi, Coley. Good to see you, darling. Don't go away. It's working, yeah. Um, now, how do I stop this? Um, what do I do? Um,